This video is sponsored by Squarespace, a great all-in-one platform for starting a website and doing fun things on the internet with. So there's this really good movie called They Live, directed by John Carpenter. It's about this guy, John Nada, who stumbles onto a pair of sunglasses and puts them on and sees the world as it really is. Sees that all the media around him is propaganda. Sees that the world is being controlled by a bunch of aliens trying to harvest the value of people. And there's one scene in particular that I want to talk about, definitely my favorite. In it, John tries to get his friend to put on the sunglasses too, and is met with extreme resistance, a shockingly long and grueling fight scene that seems to come out of nowhere. Either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. Not this year. Now, a lot has already been made of this scene. Thick brains like Slavo Žižek have talked about it and made some thick points, but for our purposes, this is the only interesting question. Why does this guy fight back so much? To him, they're just sunglasses, right? Sunglasses that his best friend wants him to try on. What's the big deal? See, there is no clear motivation here. All there is is this instinctive, unexplained desire to fight against the thing that will allow him to see the truth. This violent reflex to not understand what's right in front of his eyes. Anyway, the 2016 DreamWorks movie Trolls has this exact scene in it, but somehow weirder. And I guess that's what we'll be talking about in this video. Just a little shorty, you know? A fun day for me. So, okay. Let's put a pin in all that They Live stuff for now, and just introduce the film Trolls. In a lot of ways, Trolls feels like an incredibly on-the-nose and kinda stock movie. In a lot of ways, it is that. The movie is about two groups of creatures. The trolls, who feel pleasure all the time, who sing and dance and have parties constantly, and the Bergen, the larger creatures who ostensibly never feel pleasure, except when they are literally consuming the body of trolls and extracting their joy, a ritual they like to perform once a year on Trollstis. Once a year, every year, the Bergens would gather around the troll tree to taste happiness. But here's the thing. 20 years ago, the trolls escaped. And now, by the time the meat of the film begins, the Bergen haven't felt troll-induced pleasure for a long time. And just looking at this premise, it's already kinda obvious, isn't it? The movie is about consumerism. It's a very explicit critique of the relationship between pleasure and the consumption of objects. And in a sort of clever way, there are two sides to that critique. On one hand, we have the trolls, the exploited class, whose very lives are taken from them in the name of providing joy for those in power. On the other, we have the Bergen, the consumer culture, and they're not particularly benefiting from this relationship either. It's not good to have your entire notion of happiness wrapped up in a product that can, at best, be attained once a year, and at worst can never be gotten. The belief that eating trolls is the only way to experience joy creates a society of constantly deferred satisfaction, a status quo of misery, punctuated by brief, fleeting moments of joy. You will never, ever, ever, ever be happy. Never? And when our plucky protagonist, Poppy, ends the film by revealing that the Bergen don't actually need trolls to be happy by saying this line, Happiness isn't something you put inside, it's already there. Sometimes you just need someone to help you find it. It very much feels like the film is reaching through the screen and shouting at us. Material objects are not the key to happiness. Happiness is something inherent to us. It can't be bought and sold, and such an action should not be attempted. So, nice. I've accomplished the taxing mission of adequately interpreting a pretty obvious kids movie. Congratulations to me. And its message and the way it's delivered is good, if a bit standard. I like the movie fine. But what I really find interesting about Trolls comes into clearer focus when we talk about the antagonist of the film. Honestly, one of my favorite antagonists from any kids movie called The Chef. 
On first blush, the chef seems like a pretty normal antagonist. 20 years ago, she dropped the ball, let the trolls escape, and was banished from the Bergen Kingdom. She is hereby banished from Bergen Town forever! I'll be happy again! I'll find the trolls! And now, after finally discovering the trolls again, she captures them and tries to bring them back to the Bergen. Very average stuff for a DreamWorks film. But when we look closer at who the chef is and what she wants, we can see that there's something off about her. That her character doesn't hang together all that well. Like, considering what I just said about the plot, we'd think her motivations would be obvious. She was the chef, forced out of the kingdom for not providing trolls. Now, she's bringing the trolls back in an effort to become the chef again. But nope, she actually wants to be queen, and she thinks that's what she's working toward with her villainous plot. She frequently brings up how much power she's going to have. With me in charge, I'll serve you troll every day of the year! With me as queen, all of life will be a never-ending feast of happiness! And it leaves you with the question, how? How does she intend to get all this power? Like, I guess the idea is that she'll get everyone into trolls again, manipulate the king into bringing back Trollstice, and then once they're all hooked, she'll leverage that to become queen? What exactly are you proposing? Bringing back Trollstice? For everyone? Hmm. Yes, that's exactly what I'm proposing! Great idea, sire. Absolutely brilliant. But this just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Trollstice is a tradition, right? Bergen have been eating trolls for years. And this chef lady was presumably in control of the trolls for many of those years. In that time, she wasn't able to secure some queenship, so what's the difference now? How have her powers changed in the last 20 years to give her this opportunity? At another point in the film, she also strongly hints at the idea that she's going to assassinate the king to gain power. And I, your loyal chef, will be right behind you. Holding a knife. What's that? Holding a knife, a spoon, a ladle, I'm your chef after all. And this makes even less sense somehow. Why craft an entire diabolical plan around getting everyone, including the king, addicted to trolls so that he'll give you power if you're down to just kill him? Just do that, right? Blat 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 and you're the queen bee. It honestly just seems like a far better and less complicated scheme, you know? So why am I saying all these little nitpicks? Am I cinema sins now? Is it ding ding o'clock? Well, not exactly. The reason I find the chef and her strange motives so interesting is that in a very real way, her big scheme, her ambition, her idea of upward mobility. By this time tomorrow, I'll be queen, and all of Bergen Town will get exactly what they deserve. True happiness! <laughs> They're all kind of phony, illusory. Look, maybe there is some explanation for these things I've pointed out. Maybe the throne is accessible now in a way it wasn't 20 years ago. Maybe she could have been ruler before, but only cares about ruling now for some reason. I don't know. But none of that stuff really matters, does it? None of it gets time within the story. And because of that absence, that lack of coherent motivation, it's harder to look at the chef as this standard, cunning, ambitious, self-serving villain who stands to profit from making the world a worse place. Instead, she just kind of feels like a cog in this ideological machine. A Bergen whose only clear purpose is to perpetuate the notion that consuming these objects, these trolls, is the exclusive way to gain pleasure. Everything else about her is just an unexplained and ambiguous instrument meant to justify her doing that. And nowhere is this more obvious, more poignant, than in one scene toward the middle of the movie, the one I've been waiting to talk about all along. In the scene, the chef and King Gristle are getting ready for Trollstice. And for some reason, the chef decides that it's really important for Gristle to eat a troll, like right now. Shouldn't we wait for Trollstice? 
Sire, every day is trollstice when you have trolls. I said for some reason there, because I have literally no idea what she's aiming for in this scene. Trollstice is tomorrow. There's no good reason to think he'll abolish this popular and beloved tradition before then. And besides, she plans on killing the king. So what does she care if he likes trolls, if he's addicted to them? He'll be dead soon anyway. And yet, she wants this. She wants him to eat this little guy, gain the happiness he provides, help him understand that for Bergen, consuming this thing is what it's all about. I am the king. Uh, uh, but I think I should share this moment with all the kingdom. Uh, eat it. <clears throat> I started off this video talking about a scene in They Live. As I said before, that scene is about asking a question. Why does this dude not want to put on the glasses? The world around him is occupied by aliens, a hegemony that oppresses him and everyone like him. And yet, not even knowing what these glasses will do, he fights so vehemently against them. What does he stand to gain? And I love trolls because in this scene, the film asks the same question about the opposite character. We don't know how the chef will get power from all this, how she'll become queen, why she's force-feeding the king this troll. We don't even know why she wants to stick to this troll system in the first place. It's a system that ruined her life, that got her banished from the kingdom for 20 years, and then allowed back in only because she found this resource again. It's a system that convinces everyone, herself presumably included, that they are inherently miserable creatures. Why would she fight to uphold that to this extent? See, we want to be able to interpret this character in the same way we interpret most children's movie antagonists. As an enemy, someone we can blame and call selfish. And it's weird and somehow refreshing to look at one of these so-called villains and be left again with the question, what does she actually stand to gain? One notable fact about the chef that I'd like to close this video out on is that she never once eats a troll. That's kinda weird, right? I mean, within the movie, it's implied that consuming trolls actually does produce happiness of some kind. The Bergen have been doing this for a long time, and it would be strange for the chef to be so insistent about other people eating them if they didn't have a pleasure-inducing effect. What's more, there's no reason to think that the chef knows that the Bergen can get happy from things other than troll consumption. This was a myth she grew up with, you know? It defines her as a character. And yet, she doesn't consume one, doesn't even consider it, shoves them in the king's mouth instead of her own. For whatever reason, perhaps just because of some reflexive instinct, perpetuating this structure, reproducing this bleak consumerism, deferring pleasure, is far more important to her than her own happiness. I guess it makes some sense, though. After all, she's the chef. No character in the film calls her by another name, and they'd have no reason to. This is just what she does. So, that's the end of the video, and now it's time for my outro and Patreon question of the video and stuff, but first a word from our sponsors. Squarespace is a really great all-in-one platform for starting your website. Like, me for instance, I love my three friends more than anything in the world, but our pictures were all over the place and I didn't have anywhere to organize them. But a simple drag and drop onto our Squarespace template, and boom, I have my website so me and my three friends can love each other and love on each other. Seriously, it was really easy to get started on it, and if you want 10% off your first purchase, be sure to use the coupon code BIGJOEL. You can find the link in the description. So, that's it. That's the video. Thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, now it's time for my Patreon question. Pavlov's Dong asks, Do you have art that you're embarrassed that you like? What are your thoughts on that in general? Yeah, you know, I do have, like, guilty pleasures. Not like trolls or any of the other things I talk about on the channel, uh, because I get a lot out of that stuff. But there's definitely media that, um, that just goes right through me, that adds nothing to my life, that I just watch mindlessly, uh, and doesn't help me at all. And yeah, sometimes I, I do feel guilty about that. I can't think of any examples offhand, though. 
Um, in general, I think people are over policing about the idea of the guilty pleasure as they're just the admittance that you ever feel bad about your media habits or anything like that is just like, why would you do that? All media is great. And it's like, not for everybody. Sometimes you watch something and it's vapid and you don't like it and you just keep watching it because it's easy. And, you know, maybe that's not always the best. Uh, anyway, that's my answer. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. Give me money on Patreon if you want to. I That would be cool. Um, okay, bye.